All right, we're about to jump into it. You're going to be talking about range method. This is the concept that had the most impact on the way I train and think about injuries, think about hypertrophy. It's a cheat code. It still remains a secret despite the best efforts of many. I'm going to uh, start with a bit of a slideshow around this and then we'll discuss, share experiences, questions, observations. Some of you might have seen the slides, but I'm going to uh, narrate and share. Record. Here we are. You see the slides there? Cool. So we're going to, have to speak from the perspective of the tendon secrets because when you understand range, then it uh, it gives the, the possibility the opportunity that we're going to move into some of this more explosive stuff. And at some point you realize that strength training, as fun as it is, as cool as it is, as good as it is to be jacked, is never going to get you to the fluency and fluidity of movement that this man has and, and many others. So what do we do about that? Do we ignore it and just pretend that weight training is all good? Or do we, do we address it? Do we think about, okay, well, what, what allows you to feel this fluency? Look at some of these landings, single limb, upper body. There's something different about this. And obviously I'm going to the extreme examples here. It's not probably all that everybody gets to, to this level, but when you understand causing adaptations in the tenants and, and getting progressive load into them, new levels are possible. And I've experienced this a lot myself with the upper body and also with the lower body. I had knee tendonitis for a long time, at bicep tendonitis, at tricep tendonitis. Maybe many of you have experienced the same. Once you understand and gain a significant amount of long-range strength, you will not have that same propensity to injury, to issues in the tendons that you have had before. And this is this is the extreme. Like Stefan Holmes is short. And he, he kept winning championships over and over again, like 180 centimeters. He's a massive outlier. He's still jumping well today. And he's one of the few guys who full squatted. It's one of the examples. But extreme function of tendons. If you go to the other extreme, big guys, this man, Werner Gunther, if you haven't seen this whole series, you definitely need to check it out. It's linked there uh, inside of the Athletic Vault. You will find it on YouTube as well if you if you – Look for uh, Werner Gunther. As you can see, it's just Gunther in the, the top corner there. But he was very supple as well as um, having extreme plyometric ability. And you can see his whole training system is laid out within this video. He's a big man. He's like 110 kilos plus. He wasn't fully stretching with that, obviously, but he has this plyometric ability. And he was a world-class shot putter. I think he won some titles and championships. Often big athletes think that it's it's not possible for them. I avoided plyometrics with my big athletes. My, my athletes could never get to that standard because I was concerned that I was going to flare up their tendons and that was going to ruin their careers. And you, you cause an issue and then it becomes very difficult to get back from there. Here we are with some late night. Now, at the other extreme, are these grinding heavy movements of the arm wrestlers and putting a lot of load into bone, fascia, tendon, ligaments, and testing these structures to see if they're going to break. That's the arm wrestler. Most, most people have seen those movie scenes of the arm breaking during arm wrestling. So this is tissue and adaptation. Bones can become stronger. 
ligaments can become stronger, tendons can become stronger. It's all going to adapt if we can put force through it. It's the same thing when we're thinking about this explosive power, jumping off the top of the ladder, being able to accept massive amounts of force quickly. If the tissues can already handle it, in children, the tissues can already handle it. So the, t- the, ch- the child will just do this stuff without, without training, without having that foundation of training. Why is it that the child's tissues are this natural latex? We don't care about sleeping on it, but we do care about it with our body. And how do we restore that suppleness to tissues? The suppleness of a, of, of a breakdancer, of a ballerina. What can we do with our strength training to, to get this? Yes, we can just jump. We can we can just go and sprint. We can do plyometrics. But it works until it doesn't. When you have tendon pain, then you can't do it anymore. So what do you do about it? Muscles and tendons reverse loads. The ability to amortize is going to depend on the t- the quality of the tendon of the tissue. So the strength of the muscle is what's going to load the tendon. If we're thinking about jumping, in. but then we have to be able to put the force. We have to be able to receive that force. We have to be able to instantaneously create that muscle tension. Put the tendon to work. If the muscle gives way, the tendon can't help. So some people's tendons just can't take the volume required for bodybuilding is a story that I heard from one of the top voices. One of the top guys in body composition in the world was saying some people's tendons just can't take it. I don't now know that not to be true. The idea that tendons have a a mileage limit. Okay, he's just done the amount that his body is going to take. No, we see the body reversing reversing the issues that it has. So the if it fits your macros approach to nutrition is not going to bring the highest quality tendons. You need the right amino acids in the blood to be able to get the best response. We know this now from tendon research and connective tissue research that it does matter what's in the blood at the time when the tissues are strained. If the good quality stuff is in the blood, then you will get improved uptake of that into tendons. The the study was done with uh, gelatin and skipping, and they had like, I think it was like radioactive gelatin. You know, they were able to nuclear trace and radioactive is probably not the right word, but it's nuclear, uh, whatever they call it, you can, where you can see where it goes. And they were able to show that the training together with the nutrition increased the uptake significantly to that specific area. So for humans, you you get that feeling when you have connective tissue. I We just had pig feet the other day, but whenever you had tenderness, gelatinous stuff, slow cooked stuff, there's something in the body that says like, yes, this is, this is really good. We know that glycine is the most commonly under consumed amino acid. So if you eat more of what your tendons need, that's going to help. The myth of rest, ice, uh, traditional strength training, load management, it's not the most effective way to deal with this stuff. We don't need to talk about the tenon properties as much because we're going to go into how this all fits with the range. But this is baseline factors for tenon health. So if we want to be able to perform these high-speed movements, high-reactive movements, massive, like heavy load mass movements, under stretch, the mechanics of the angles makes a difference and deal with spikes in volume, 
how can we best prepare for that? That's the, the discussion for today. When they do get sore, heat, circulation, stop doing what hurts. It goes the same for any tissue, really. Long term, what we need is antagonist length is one of the factors that doesn't really get spoken about much. So if you've got hamstring, tendon issues, taking tension out of the quads is also a good idea. If you've got tricep tendon issues, taking tension out of the biceps is a good idea. So the resting tension on the antagonist also is going to influence how chronically active that muscle is. The muscle is going to be able to relax more if they have the the muscle where the tendon sore is going to be able to relax more if the antagonist is uh, has been stretched. So big fan of the heat. Stretch the antagonist. That's the famous ATG pairing of split squats and seated good mornings. And then we want a high volume of concentric work. Example of like short range hamstring. It is different with the flexor muscles versus the extension muscles. Yeah. Okay, so... You definitely get significant soreness using short range hamstring stuff. It's different to short range extension triceps and quads where you're locking out onto the joint in a way. With these, there's no joint lockout when you're in the shortened position. So you will get sore, but you aren't loading the tendon through stretch and you will be able to deal with more of that. So you'll see these high volume concentrics showing up in lots of different systems. They don't understand it through this logic, but they've arrived to it regardless. The I learned about the uh, Bulgarian gymnastics team using high repetition calf raises without stretch for Achilles issues, 150 reps. It's the same kind of idea as the ROKP. So progress load, progress length, and progress speed. These are the three types of progression that we want. I posted about it today uh, on my IG. Someone asked me straight away, like, you know, Joel Seedman, only he, he's talking about load progression. That's that's the key thing. Yeah, load progression is important. But when you also progress length, you unlock another level of durability. And we've seen this now across far too many people to be under dispute about it. But it was already it, w- it was never really under dispute. You already had it with Taekwondo. You already had it with weight uh, with even weightlifting, but um, break dancing and ballet. It was never really under question from anyone who's looking, not looking at the world through a straw. You can see that length is not causing a lack of speed. Most sprinters are supple. It's team sport athletes that have got bad or bad information that tend to be very tight. So they're getting that sequence, short range, mid range, long range is the tendon secret. Ultimately, that's what we want. We we want to be able to do the the high speed stuff. That's why I led with this presentation with range is because we want to be able to do the high speed stuff, but to be able to do the high speed stuff, we need short range. We need to understand how to not annoy the tendon. And then when you can get to the point of being able to do cold KOT squats, extreme long range stuff. You're just naturally going to feel more like a child where you don't have to warm up for things to the same degree. My boy can stand up on the table and jump off the table without needing to warm up, without thinking twice about it. It's because of tissue quality at the baseline level. It's not because he practices a lot. It's because the tissues are healthy. So this is a a method for restoring the the tissue health. Progress speed, light to heavy. This is the Gold Coast. This is the Australian uh, surf, high-performance center for surfers in Australia, where he did the month-long camp with Sonny Bill Williams when he just signed the biggest contract in rugby league history to sign with the Toronto team. I think Sonny's on the camera there. How I... uh, 
manage to get him filming filming my stuff. It's it's a bit wrong, but um, yeah, he's yeah a world class athlete. We spent a month on this stuff, short and long range, and we were both running the best we'd run in a very long time. By the end of that, I didn't really care about running that much for quite a while before this, but this is probably at the end of about four months of serious ATG training. I just went and did a camp with Sonny in New Zealand because he was concerned he wasn't going to make the Rugby World Cup. I went over there for a couple of weeks with him. He actually strained his hamstring on the first day that I got there. And then, uh, yeah, we are kind of like working on his hamstring during that that time. But in the end, he made the World Cup, and that was, uh, that was the goal of the mission. And then he signed the biggest contract in rugby league history where they were telling him he wasn't going to make it. And, there was a decent chance he wasn't gonna wasn't gonna get there. So these are our levels of tendon ability, but it's also this progression of of short range to extreme force, extreme intensity. There's a guy, a uh, DAC something. Maybe maybe you've seen him on IG. Let me see if I pull up his. Uh, he does a lot of impulse stuff. It's cool. DAC performance and health. He's a little bit, bit like uh, Devin Kelly in a, he's kind of deep thinking posts, a little bit different tone, but another deep thinker in the training space, DAC performance and health. You should also check out Devin Kelly if you haven't checked him out. He, he focuses a lot on this impulse style of training, but if you don't understand the sequencing of this stuff, it's it can be crazy to to jump into that. So he he's able to jump off maybe like ten feet for sets of he does like big reps sometimes. He might do sets of fifty or sets of a hundred of jumping off these really high places. This is the impulse training, and parkour athletes are doing it as well. It's not the thing is like if you if you look outside of the the boxes that we put ourselves in of different sports and different disciplines. You can see things are getting done. So I love looking at the arm wrestling world, the ultimate of slow strength, heavy, um, short range work inside of the arm wrestling. The long range light stuff, you know, maybe Kadoziani might be the, the king of this, right? Where if you if you can go really light and do a lot of really long long range stuff, then when you go and do the impulse, you'll have more, more to be able to handle. You know, Ben Patrick's, gone live with his um, sleds and you know, a lot of people are, are buying the sleds. Ultimately for the everyday Joe, I think the best system that no one's really, it's not really being communicated that well yet is if you were to do short range, high circulation and light long range, you could probably restore most people to amazing body composition, feeling amazing without any of the risk, without any of the challenge. They don't actually want those last three. They don't want anything heavy. They don't want anything fast. They don't want impulse. I would want them to want that. <laughs> like we want to inspire them that eventually they get on the train, that they want to do CrossFit or, you know, weightlifting or basketball or something. But ultimately, instead of the eat less, move more message, we should have something like this, this kind of a message of, you know, do some grindy short range stuff walk backwards on a sled, do lockout work, KOT calf raises, you know, reverse KOT calf raises are the safest way to do them, facing with your back to the wall. And then hit that long range light stuff. I mean, that's kind of yoga, but we can bring, we can break some of the dogma of yoga or take it to other people, one and two. But then for the rest of us, if we do care about athletic performance, then we've got to get to four and five. We can't stop at three. <laughs> I stopped at three for a long time because it's like, well, the rugby players are going out there bashing shit into each other. So they're already doing the heavy fast. They're already doing the impulse. So you can get away with as the strength coach, just doing one, two, three, but then you're not really an athlete. You still got to do, you got to do four and five. By the weightlifting, impulse training, parkour, breakdancing, something. To be, to be this freakish red guy. You see, he's not getting tired. He's just jumping and jumping. That's what we want. So this is the intro to our discussion around range training. We'd love to open up 
questions, thoughts, ideas, experiences. This is the the seed for the discussion today. I'll just jump in to say this is all new to me, thinking about the tendons when training, but I'm excited to uncover the treasure that's probably been just out of reach until I came across it. So really excited to be coming across all this information now. So thank you. Welcome. Do, do, uh, does, do someone else want to give a brief introduction to where we're coming at these concepts from? Sam's probably the one who can do an impromptu reel. Were you putting me on the spot? You want me to go? Yeah. What what's the what's the summary you're looking for? Just what we're idea of uh, short and long range. Yeah, how short and long range impact tendons. So this is this is all very interesting stuff for me. I I came from a background where like my my original boss was a student of uh john meadows and so like it, you know john meadows studied under charles for a bit so like there were some pieces of the puzzle there where you know we we used the sleds but i never thought of them from a healing perspective we knew it was gentle but like you know when my former boss ruptured his patellar tendons it was backwards on the uh on the stationary bike so there was always pieces of the puzzles for me when i was uh when I was uh, seeing all this stuff uh, on, in the field, and then when I came across this ATG stuff, it came the ATG, the the, the short range, the long range, and the and these concepts. It kind of just it clicked with me and understanding that, you know, why certain movements would make me more sore than other ones, why certain things would be more gentle than other ones, as opposed to just picking exercises based off of pushing and pulling and and whatnot. The idea here with uh, with range training, and I'll do my best at, at a quick impromptu here, would be that you are you want to be able to the tendons are what's holding the body, the connected tissue is what's holding your body together. The muscles are what um the muscles here are I'm 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 blank now. I was put on the spot way too hard there, Keegan. Sorry. <laughs> You're a good man. You're yeah. good. Uh yeah, so the the key concept, and I think like what John Meadows and, and Charles really cared about was that you got more hypertrophy if you stretched as well, if if the muscle had more stretch. But you had to sequence these things carefully because if you jump straight into the heavy stretching hypertrophy exercises, then you, you might damage a tendon, you might tear a tendon, or you might just ir irritate things. So if you watch his workouts on YouTube, John Meadows, he had a good workout with uh, Jeff Nippard, arm workout. He never puts the long range first. He doesn't always put it last either, but um, you see the sequencing of, of the workout. And that was what Charles was, was doing as well. If you look at Charles's workouts, you can see that he sequenced things where the long range was the thing that was going to tear it up. And um, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to start with that. You don't want to start with the incline bicep curls. Now you, you you can if you're healthy already, and you could go from like two kilos to four kilos. You know you can just do a long warm up and it'll be fine. But they generally went for like an activation exercise, which was the short range, um, which is when the muscle is not under much stretch. So this like a simple way to look at it is with the bicep curls, Luke. And, and man, like if you're facing face down into the bench, 45 degrees, you, they call it like spider curls is a common way to call them. Then the muscle will be like more like crampy. So it's short. And then the tendon never feels like it's under stretch. If you've irritated your bicep tendon, trying to do some one arm chin, chin ups or something, then or boxing or something. But then when you, when you do those movements, like you, you're, you'll, you'll feel less of the tendon. You definitely won't feel it at the bottom uh, unless you go really heavy. And then of course, like the tension is there as well, but and um, with those movements, you create the mind muscle connection. So the purpose of the short range is to strengthen the mind muscle connection. So if someone has a muscle that doesn't switch on too much, like I was talking about in my glute uh, Instagram post a couple of days ago, you can use the short range stuff and you can get some hypertrophy out of massive volume of short range work. Uh, I think you see that with the ATG coaches. I think some of it is the fact that of so much short range work and heavy short range, um, but everyone's doing long range as well. So it's hard to differentiate. Uh, but for sure, you get massive, you know, 
you get good hypertrophy results when you hit both. And that was ultimately what Charles and John Meadows cared about most was that you're, you're getting maximal hypertrophy because you're using the exercise where the tendon isn't under stretch. And then you also use exercise where it is under stretch and then you use the mid range where it's like a standards kind of standing curl would be the other example. Uh, but where I'm coming at it with this conversation is this unlocks other levels and we need to, we should explore those other levels. Like if we really want to maximally bulletproof people, they need to be either going and playing basketball and dunking, you know, once a week, or we design a session for them that requires something of their tendons. So today I did my lower body speed day. I'm following the West side week layout now. Um, so Fridays is the lower body speed day. And so this day for me has to have some impulse. It has to have some jumping because for way too long, I didn't do enough of it. And it made me fragile, even with doing strength training. Now, I wasn't doing ATG. I wasn't doing as much long range stuff, but you can get better in the gym and become worse at uh, being ready for sports. And that's that happens for guys who go, they go into the gym for many years and they go play paddle tennis and they snap their Achilles. It's like, well, were you doing long range calf work in the gym? Were you doing any of it with speed? You know, if you weren't, then you're much more likely to have that issue. Uh, so quite a long discussion, Luke. And it, it takes a little while to get your head around the concept. I, I wrestled with it for about a year. I was, I'd been wrestling with it for about a year, probably when someone sent me Ben Patrick's IG. And so when I looked at his IG and he, and he was saying, look, you know, Charles Pollock could influence them getting these results with knees. I was like, oh, this is good. And, he, and I could see his workouts. He's posting workouts at that stage. And I was like, oh, this is sequenced in the way I've been thinking about this stuff. Now, he wasn't thinking about it in that way, but he just recognized and, and, and worked it out that, okay, this feels great when you do this. And so, yeah, it was like since then, I've sort of, it, it gradually became more clear and I could see it on all the exercises. And that's what I see with coaches as well. Like initially it's it's like not so clear, but as you think about it more, you can see it at every joint. So we are going to put a movement library to show like short and long range for every uh, every muscle uh, or all the major muscle groups because that's something that guys have asked for and it makes it simpler to get started. But I want you to understand the concepts and you should be able to, through your functional anatomy and just knowledge of the body, know which ones are going to be short range, which ones are going to be long range. Um, I'll give you another example, just one more before we throw it open to other questions, observations. Uh, is you know the tricep extension. So the tr traditional cable tricep extension is, I guess it's 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 mostly like a mid range exercise because the when the forearm is parallel to the floor, that's when it's going to be hardest. If you put the elbows behind the body, like in a tricep kickback, that's part of the reason why tricep kickbacks got a lot of shit put on them is because the hardest part is there, and that's when the muscle is short, and therefore it's not going to be the most hypertrophic. But it is actually a smart way to exercise. If you've got tricep tendonitis, I get myself tricep tendonitis a bunch of times doing crazy heavy bench presses or trying to do handstand push-ups, just jumping into them and doing kickbacks and, and even just doing uh, the banded pu push downs as well. If you don't, if you use the band, it becomes more long range because when it's here, there's still not much tension on the band. But when we get a little bit deeper, then there's more tension on the band, right? You get, you get where I'm coming from. Uh, so this is like a, a short range tricep stuff. And this is beautiful to do before you bench. You get your triceps turned on, your tendons are happy. There's no there's no pain, there's no inhibition. It's going to make you stronger when you can just blast and there's no fear. But then the long range is like the, the French press behind the neck, um, tricep extension. You can do them with the cable. Um, you can do them with the dumbbell. And you can play around getting funky with like trying to get even longer range with like slight side bending or leaning back or like you can get to the to the nth degree. But it, the, it, you don't necessarily have to do that. It depends if there's like a benefit to be gained. Like for the hamstrings, there's a benefit to be gained if you're a hand, hand balancer or the little tweaks of like putting your foot on the slant and stuff. Like I've taken that fairly extreme because I like being able to do press handstands and still to press and stuff. So getting to extreme long range like that is valuable. Uh, I could talk about this stuff for a long time. The, the, the joint health also is a factor. When you come to the knee, the game changes a bit because you've got meniscus in there as well. And you've got cartilage and you've got, you know, more factors going on. So when we go into like the natural knee extension, the, the longest range quad stuff, we have to also consider where is the meniscus at? Cause too many guys have popped meniscus just going at long range quad stuff. 
but then they don't understand that okay there's a there's a joint factor in here as well which needs to be considered ahead of the the muscles because the muscles and tendons will more or less adapt but the the connective tissues the meniscus like you, you don't want to mess with that it's it's really annoying if you pop or uh, damage those tissues really long answer luke more than you bargained for but uh th there's a treasure trove of stuff here that you can go to another level as a coach and you have another level of confidence to take on stuff that you didn't necessarily want to take on before um at least that's yeah been, that's what I mean. totally i will appreciate the answer uh, this is part of my programming now so i've got an atg coach taking me through it cool. i see there's courses cool. and stuff in the back end here of uncom so yeah i'm excited to unpack it and level up as a coach and athlete Excellent. Let's get it. Uh, hey, guys. Um, it, you know, I've definitely, for myself, uh, being on a little bit on the older side, had to use um, use a lot of these tactics, and they really work wonders. And uh, taking it from driving as much blood into the area as a warm-up and um you know doing uh the the banded hamstring curls um just to get my legs going after uh i've done a little bit of uh backwards walking i if i'm at the gym i'll just take the emergency stop out of the treadmill and just kind of push push the the tread backwards um and then for elbow issues uh and and bicep uh, i had a bicep tendon repair um, I was a dumbass and tried to do one arm tire flips and, uh, <laughs> ruptured my bicep tendon. Um, so, uh, but since doing that, it definitely, it definitely has, uh, been really, really helpful. And as, as far as bringing it into my clients, I found with some of the older people that I work with, uh, and some new people it's great because you can get them into training and not put them through crippling workouts to where they can't move for a few days. A lot of, a lot of times for people, they, they have this, they don't want to be, you know, walking uh, terribly, not being able to sit down. They have to be functional. A few doctors that I worked with in the past, they have, sometimes have to be doing six hour surgeries and they can't, they can't sacrifice their body for what's supposed to be getting them in shape. And this, uh, these techniques are really a great way to start introducing strength training um, to them and not have them, uh, you know, I guess building up their tissue tolerance and uh, building up their body's ability to um, get into these movements and start exercising and uh, in short order, you definitely see some strength strength gains as well when you apply, uh, you know, some of the dense methods into it. But this this kind of stuff really has become the warm up every every day. Um, I do have a, a a couple questions related to the nutrition that you were talking about, especially um, working with older populations. Um, and even for myself, I guess I have to put myself in the older population and wanting to get back to springing and running and jumping in a more robust way. Um, like you were saying, you were having some, uh, some pork knuckle or something like that. Uh, and I've also heard that chicken has uh, a certain type of cartilage like a high lean cartilage which uh is 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 uh also really good now is are they all in the realm of glycine and yeah uh you know is there um is it uh a re you know something that should be on a regular basis um anyway just for someone in a little bit of an older age um because they're always uh their tissues say hi gonna say hi oh now you get quiet we should keep you i'll keep your picture up more often <laughs> you yeah say hi? yeah so uh, and, and and like uh is uh 
EAA, like an essential amino acid supplement, just fine, um, even though it's tough to get down because that can really taste like a glass full of vomit if you get some, uh, you know, without any flavors added. Uh, if you go to like bulk supplements for an EAA uh, group that I was just basically having uh, a short glass of that after each training session. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there is that research around with yeah. 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 Um, just before they're using, I think 30 minutes before the skipping workout. And I was showing that it was, you put it in the blood and then you create the demand for it in the tissue and the body knows what to do with it. And it is a chronically depleted amino acid. Like most people are not getting as, as much as they should. Uh, glycine. So it is the slow cooked stuff of uh, coming from beef, coming from chicken. Also great. Yeah. It doesn't, there's no one source, but it tends to be like the, the slow cooked or when the skin is still on uh, these kinds of things, there's more gelatinous uh, cuts and, and um, yeah, you can, you can get that from there. Some people say that the collagen, if you buy like collagen supplements, like yeah. that are hydrolyzed, they're the easiest ones to consume. Yeah. Some say that they're not as powerful in terms of they're not as well absorbed, they're not as well utilized. I don't know. You know it's difficult to measure with, with that sort of stuff. But I'm a fan of gelatin, like you know, beef gelatin. There's different kinds of fish ones now. Um, and But yeah, the, the, creating the tissue demand as well. I think you've got to – like the research is done on the skipping – it would be really interesting to see if research was done on long range stuff, incline bicep curls, um, long range calf raises, or mm, like the long range hamstring work. And when we talk about tendon, like we could be talking about fascia, like it, it runs all the way along. It's a continuum between the tendon and the fascia, and then the next tendon, and then the bony insertion. So it's, it's going to be all the way along that it's going to become stronger as well. And when muscle tears happen, say in a hamstring, like it can be that the fascia tears kind of in the middle of the muscle, it's kind of the same thing as a tendon, tendon tear. So that's the, the other thing is like, it's not just at the tendon, it's, it's going to be deposited all the way along and they're going to become more elastic. They're going to become higher quality because the demand is there. It's going to get laid down. Like we know that anything we don't use, it goes away. Like the muscle atrophies when we stop using it, right? You know, if you put your arm in the sling, the muscle's all gone. What you don't think is like the tendon's all gone too and the fascia's going too. So, so when you work it, then it's going to grow. Um, and you can be like, that's the concept. There's another lecture that I have, like muscle dominance versus tendon dominance. Did this, did this workout force more protein into the muscle or did it force more connective tissue into the fascia and tendon and the insertions you're always going to be getting both but if you train traditionally in strength training like this is why stones are thrown all the time at strength training and it's it's justified because yeah okay you keep dominant you keep putting the emphasis on the muscle over and over and over for years and years you're kind of relying on the sport to keep them healthy but then as soon as they stop having the sport then they're getting this cycle of injury so uh, this was um Wow, I was really excited as you've been talking about this 12 month all in one programming because it seems like a lot of times when uh, people are feeling strong and workouts are going good, they just say like another set, 10 more pounds, uh, I'll, I'll do another workout. And what really needs to be done is it actually needs to be like, um, uh, scheduled like it's actually time like uh ankle work uh knee work hip uh in the light mobility just flooding with blood so that they can keep uh you know having that discipline to just stay within their workouts and progress them appropriately in the amount of time and sets and reps that they need uh instead of like more 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 pop yeah uh, yeah, I think so, the, the, yeah it's the more 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 pop with you know for with have have thor bjornsson or you, know, you see it with the guys on power power lifters and such I don't, I 
like they've done muscle dominance for a long time and never, yeah. never put any yeah. plyometric force on the tendon and they never put any stretch force on the tendon. And then all of a sudden one day it goes, it was like, well, it took, it took you a long time, but you, you know, you keep doing the same thing. My guess is if they just did some long range stuff, they wouldn't, they wouldn't even get that. West side barbell, they did the speed stuff. West side was the most plyometric, highest force training system that's been used in the gym probably, um, but definitely in the powerlifting world. And powerlifters threw stones saying, hey, this is not specific. This is not going to get the results. But for everyone who's not a powerlifter, it's an amazing system because it, it it is giving you that speed stimulus. The thing is that with because those guys were so heavy, of course they're not really going to take it to the extreme of doing the impulse training. They weren't going to do popping and stuff like that. Like they, they, it was enough for them to jump up onto boxes. They weren't going to jump down off of them, or they weren't going to do hopping because the you know they're three hundred pounds at five foot eight. You know it's it's not like they they didn't need to take it that far. But we probably should. And if we can move the posts, like that, that's been one of the goals of mine for quite a few years as well. It's like, let's move the posts away from being as big as we can be because that ends up ugly. Even natural bodybuilding is still kind of ugly in a way. Um, and when it's not natural, like, I don't know, like let's let's move the posts away from that. Let's not focus on being the biggest man. Like, so how do we do that? I, I love having the skill component in there because there's always room to improve on that with your handstands, with your foot balancing, with your juggling, with your foot juggling and whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's parkour or break dancing or ballroom dancing, you know, ha have something there that you're aspiring to that you're super proud of. Um, and then if you can do the same uh if you can have that same thing with the, the the stretch side of things as well, then it gives you another outlet that it's not just all about being huge. The speed thing also becomes very interesting. I think like, imagine if instead of everyone wanting to run half marathons, like imagine this, we, we, we ban anything, any half marathons, marathons, ultra marathons, and we make everyone run 20 meters as fast as they can. And 50 meters as fast as they can, then 100 meters as fast as they can. Like, what happens to the average gym goer if they start training for 100 meters rather than all these triathlons and ultra marathons? And I don't have anything against that stuff, but it doesn't turn you, it doesn't make you young. Like, it's it's okay, but it doesn't make you young. Where when you see a 98 year old that's still able to, you know, going at sprinting 100 meters, like that's that is youth. So we should aspire, I think aspiring to speed, aspiring to skill, aspiring to stretch gives us something to aspire to that isn't just being freaking huge. And I love that there's a lot of guys that have effectively gone into that niche of like the Edo Portal type stuff that, you know, they've they've got big followings and they've grown businesses without being extremely mus muscular. Um, but yeah, if you want to use this stuff for body composition, maybe we should touch on on how this short, long range stuff, like what's the best, best way to use it for body composition? Because that is still the primary thing that most people want to start with. And then we have to work them towards or encourage them towards maybe some speed goals or maybe some skill or stretch. Or, um, should we go there a little bit? So burn the muscle glycogen. How do you burn the muscle glycogen? Tons of reps. How do you get tons of reps without tons of soreness? Short range, concentric only. You seen anyone get shredded doing lots of sled work? Like that was the that was Derek's trademark. When I was there in Florida in 2020, Derek was the sled king and he was just shredded. We we had the sculpt body scanner there. And we had two guys there scanned under 6.5. That's the only two I ever scanned under 6.5 was Derek and uh, uh, Mr. Gray. I'm, uh, blanking on his first name at the moment, but they're the, like their their performance on the sled was phenomenal. The cool thing is that like there's so little risk, there's so little skill, and you can get amazing body composition results. If you want to pair that with upper body concentric only, pull the sled, it's really low risk. This is also a thing for heart attacks. If someone comes to you and they're very unhealthy, 
and you cause them extreme amounts of tissue damage, they're not used to that. Their tissue will only deal with the amount of force that it's been dealing with in the past without getting torn up. If you go and put them through a hectic workout of long range, eccentrics, effectively what you're doing is like making them bleed all over their body inside. It's like pulling scabs off their whole muscular skeletal system. If you give them a full body workout that's long range, that's eccentrics, that's heavy, and that puts a lot of load on the kidneys. Like the extreme of it is CrossFit, right? When someone starts out with CrossFit and they get rhabdo, they go to hospital because there's too much blood that the kidneys have to filter out because there's too much bleeding in the system. Everything got torn. The opposite of that is a concentric dominant workout. It's farmer's carries and sled drags and uh, you know pulling pulling ropes, pulling sleds towards you. So you can hit a lot of volume on that. You can get amazing body composition results and then just titrate into muscle damage. Give them give them some chance to adapt to muscle damage. They don't need extreme amounts of muscle damage initially. Especially if they've never strength trained before or they haven't done anything in a long time, which is kind of who a lot of us would like to, to bring back into training or use the short range stuff, the step ups and use the very little volume of the longer range. Tell you another story. I had a, a 40 year old rugby player, Steve Menzies, legend of the game in Australia. Everyone in Australia who knows the, the game of rugby league knows Steve Menzies. He was at the club that I was coaching in, in France. He was still playing at 40. So I had him from 38, 39, 40. He wasn't squatting heavy because he never really squatted that heavy. He moved very well and he was he was a good athlete. So the other boys were squatting heavy. And then he was doing high box step ups during his high box step up, something burst in his leg and he had like this massive bleed out. It wasn't really a muscle tear. It was just like some kind of vessel in his leg burst. So in retrospect, it was like the extreme long was maybe as much of a risk as getting him just to squat moderately heavy. We're squatting full range, but when you're doing like dead start box step ups, um, that was one of the shittest things that happened to me as a strength coach working with a pro athlete. I just injured the, you know, one of the greats of the game. He's playing his last year and he, I'm giving him a regression and he hurts himself. So it's something to be considerate about as well. It's like, Hey, this long range stuff, like don't, don't mess with it with people who aren't used to doing it. He was a good athlete. He was fit. He very rarely got injured through his career, but the long range stimulus was fresh to him. So maybe that will help this message stick about long range and short range and where it fits within a client cycle. If you want to smash them, smash them with the sled. And burn the muscle glycogen off. So then the body has to release uh, fuel in there. If you don't give them glycogen after the workout, then the body will use the fat stores. The gly glycerol backbone of the fatty acid will become will be stored as the, the new glycine. Glucose is re replaced. Glycogen, muscle glycogen is replenished whether you consume carbohydrate or not, especially after you become adapted to that. But you want to use fat. <laughs> like that's the goal. The person is carrying around a fridge. This is a way to look at fat loss. Uh, these uh, Andrew Chang, right? The uh, fasting expert, keto fasting expert. He talks about, doc you know, he's a doctor of this stuff and other doctors hate him because he's reversed a lot of type two diabetes and such. He talks about like you're carrying around a freezer. So the muscle glycogen is like the fridge. It's like an immediate fuel source. You go straight to the fridge and it's there. Whereas stuff that's in the freezer, it's there for the long term. You've got your, your things that you might eat one day, but you're not really going to just grab it and eat it straight out of the freezer when it's a, a steak or something. So people were carrying around this massive freezer, which was never we were never intended to carry around so much of this this fat store, but it's because we never access it. So how do we learn to access it? We'll stop eating sugar for a period of time, stop eating glucose, and you will actually go to the fat store. Now start doing sleds on top of that. Start walking up hills. Walking up hills is sleds too. It's concentric, dominant, uh, very little eccentric. And so then you crack into those, those fat stores because of that stimulus. And if you want to fast and things like that, if you're fasting for fat loss, burn off all the muscle glycogen early in it as well. It might make you hungrier, but 
when you're in a calorie deficit, you're not even really in a calorie deficit. Why are you not in a calorie deficit? Because you liberate the calories that you already have. Are you still burning calories? You need to eat nothing. You didn't live off nothing for the day. You lived off the calories that you already have. So you need to help them to liberate those calories. And if someone has is carrying around a massive fat store, they actually don't need to eat for a long time. They can just eat from the freezer over and over again. So if you can help your clients to understand these concepts as well, like it does make you seem like you're not the first, you know, you're not a trainer who just got your certification off the back of the box. If you can, if you can explain concepts and help them understand things in a way that people haven't helped them understand it before, then you have an advantage and they want to tell their friends because they got the coolest trainer in town, you know, or on the web um, coming around to the business side of things. But yeah. These, these are secret, secret weapons. Like you, you know about things that other coaches do not know about and you can get amazing body composition results by smashing the short range stuff and you don't get that sore and you get, you get crazy shredded. Like you will get hungry because you, you, you know, you're punching through glycogen and your body will want to restore it, but it's a cheat code. You, you pulse, you get yourself fat adapted. You eat as much protein as you need. And then you pulse the fats up and down. And it's very easy to be shredded as long as you want. And that's you know, most of the natural guys who are shredded long-term. That's that's what they're doing one way or another. Where they have carbs when they eat or not, it doesn't really matter. But if you, if you have time when there's no carbs and you get crazy strong, what does crazy strong mean? It means you can punch fuel through the tank. It means you're a Ferrari. Ferrari the tank's not going to last as long. So you punch through your fuel, easy to get shredded. When you're doing like it's as a CrossFit athlete or as a powerlifter like West Side Method, very hard to be fat. Very, very hard to be fat. If 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 one of those guys tries to put on a little bit of fat, I mean very, very difficult because they're doing ex extreme volumes. So that's what you want to get to with your clients. If you just gradually titrate up the volumes, I work with um, you know, the sports model project in Australia, they've had extremely good results with uh, body composition for female athletes, a lot of female shredded women. Nick was in the program in 2016. We did a bunch of stuff together. He applied dense strength to his gym and he applied it within his system. And the system is very simple. You just gradually titrate up the volume that the person is able to deal with and you get world-class body composition results. And as the volume that they're doing increases, it becomes easier and easier to stay lean year round. Like this, this is this is how I live. This is how I've been living for a long time. And you have to really try to be fat if you want to. Like the, if you list, look at the diets of the West Side guys, they've tried so hard to be fat. They're pouring olive oil on their pizza and like you know just massive, massive effort to be fat. Like it's it's really difficult to be fat if you're going to be that strong and you're going to be punching high volume workouts. Is this making sense, gentlemen, as how we can be leaders in body composition results? You can play with some of this stuff based on client demands. The fasting has been an absolute game changer for myself, just even getting leaner. But for my clients, like I've had people who have won like, oh, like I've done it all. I've done keto. I've done this and that. And women, even so, been able to repair hormones for them, get them lean for, you know, Olympic weightlifting competitions. And yeah, yeah it, it just, it makes things very simple. It requires a little bit of mental discipline, but it's infinitely easier because it's not like, oh, I can only eat these certain things. It depends how you do the fasting, of course, but it, it just becomes a matter of, okay, well, we're going to be having to work on a little bit of mental reframing in terms of, oh, like that stomach becomes empty. Great. Now our body has a reason to go to the fat stores, like that feeling of hunger. Okay, great. Reframe. That's what fat loss feels like. We are now in this fat burning mode. You put sled on top of that. You're, you're going to be amazing. Like this is uh, for everybody, for everybody who I've ever done this with, it has always worked a hundred percent of the time, but it, it, it's a change from the conventional thinking that we need to eat multiple times per day or breakfast is the most important meal of the day, which comes from, don't quote me on whatever year it was, but from whatever labor unions, when it was like, they may not get a lunch break and they may not be able to get dinner. So they had to feed before they went off to work for the day. And it's like, well, now you look at the marketing that goes behind it and McDonald's breakfast sandwiches and blah, 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 blah. Now we eat seven, eight times per day. People's insulin sensitivity is all over the place. It's disastrous. You make the person more insulin sensitive. 
you allow their body to have a break, those digestive enzymes to do other things and just constantly be breaking down food. Yeah, they start losing fat. They start feeling better. You have more mental energy. I've been able to make so much progress by just switching to one meal a day. Occasionally, I'll do a longer fast. Some, like Even yesterday, I, I decided to do two meals. I thought I was going to have to take a nap. It was ridiculous. <laughs> but it, it, it's been phenomenal. And it also makes you more likely to put the, the fuel towards the muscle cell and less likely to store towards the fat because your body's like, oh, we're training hard. Okay, well, we need to come back bigger and stronger when the stimulus is there, without a question. And yeah, the uh, the short range stuff, like with the sled, like you can, like I have clients who are very novice, but they still want to work hard. So, well, okay, how do we do that while feeling safe? Well, you get the short range going, get the spider curls and you get with uh, the skull crushers or whatever. Like, it, you know, we can do that, get the sled work in, you know, go slant squats, whatever it is. But um, yeah, I mean, like it's, you got, you got, you definitely got to be careful with the long range stuff. I know way too many people who have blasted themselves trying to chase the pancakes because they see Ben doing and everything like that. So they'll tear a groin or, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, there's so much amazing stuff here for me that all this stuff has just been, it's made programming and working with clients. It feels like a cheat code where it's like, okay, like I got a new guy and, and he just, he just paid me for three months. And it's like, well, he's got all these different things. I'm like, well, I know where he doesn't go. I know these are all things that he needs to get good at eventually, but where do we reasonably start? How do we scale things down to a level between the volume and the frequency? And you'll find also that like, well, you're not going to be able to do, you know, RDLs, which again, great for the hamstrings, but you can't do that every day. You can leg curl. I've heard of polyquin programs where they were leg curling six times per week. You can definitely do twice per week. That's going to be healthy for the hamstring, any type of tendinopathy and, and things of that nature. But, uh, it just gives you, if you're a coach and you do programming, it gives you a much bigger picture as to like, how do you structure the specific things? And then you can start getting very niche and nuanced to, to optimize best for the client and their goals. So th there's a lot of great stuff here. I love this stuff. Yeah. The thing of when you hurt yourself going for pancake, I met a bunch of people who bothered their hamstring insertions doing pancake. That's, that's an easy way to, give yourself something. And then I talk to people like, yeah, it's been a year. It's been two years. Like I bothered it then. Or even with uh, the, the forearm ones, like, yeah, it's been a couple of years. Like I don't do handstands anymore because I'm sore in there. I can't do uh false grip. I can't do ring muscle ups anymore. Generally that stuff is like two weeks, <laughs> like two weeks of short range. Sometimes it's a week. You, you just get, you just give them a, like just circulation. Like just take the intensity way down give them circulation and then you become this genius. Like, oh, it makes my thing. I had dinner with Jack Zubalek Stakes in uh, in London. He, he he owned seven gyms when he was 22, 23. He, he went through the Poliquin system. Extremely smart man. Very smart with business. He's, he's running venture capital, uh, AI and automations and marketing systems for venture capitalists now. So he's, he's going at like the, the pointy end of, or, uh, venture capitalist or you're trading um, somewhere in the finance world, let me say. So he's a very smart young, young man. And, but we had dinner and I was like, he was thinking about like surgery and he's like, who's your shoulder specialist? And I'm like, well, what have you tried? I was like, why don't you try, just press the five kilo dumbbells for sets of 50 for me. And then next session, if it feels good, press the seven and a half. And then next session, if it feels good, press the tens. And if you feel good with it, if it feels comfortable, use the two and a halves to do like the Smith curls, the you know, lying bench curls. In four sessions and he was back to pressing 40 kilo dumbbells. <laughs> and he's like, oh, thanks. Like uh, that thing that's been bothering my shoulder for a couple of years is like, it's all good now. I think if you can get those results with people, you're going to be busy. People are going to be happy. That wasn't even a really situation common. where a client has yeah. had like something where I've not been able to help them improve if they follow what I tell them. And even adjusting the speed, like for me earlier this year, uh, technically, yeah, technically still this year, it was like, ah, uh, like the benching, like it just doesn't quite feel right anymore because I, I irritated my shoulder again. And it's like, well, we're still going to do it, but we're going to go three, 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 oh. So three seconds down, three pause, three up. And it's like, ah, uh, like, even 15 pounds, I was like, go to 10 pounds. And it humbles you. But like now I'm over here benching with like the 60s and I'm going mm -hmm. faster, full stretch, slow eccentric still, just for more time under tension. I'm fine. I'm no. overhead pressing again. Like I'm doing all these things and it's like, 
just even get was when you irritate the thing it can get like it just it gets you get in that loop and then you keep wanting to test it over again it's like oh but can i do this ah not not quite irritated it oh but can what if i do this ah you heard it again so there's a lot of those variables that you can play with at the end of the day uh, between the angles between the tempo between the uh uh, the implement that you use, the level of regression that you enter in for it, um, you know, and obviously yeah. the short, whether you go into a shorter range of motion exercise uh, where you're not putting the, the, the body at a more disadvantageous position, or you're doing something where it's generally safer. Like even for me with the, with the shoulder, it was, it was a spider curl, but it was three seconds up, three seconds down. Cause even direct bicep work is bothering it. Now I'm incline curling, even cover for curl with the external rotation as well. Cause so, similar-ish to the smith curl but just gradually building on that over time and then eventually adding more volume and intensity and building upon those things like now i'm doing 6 12 25 things for quad focus and it's like oh my god i'm dying but now i can train this hard now my body can actually put on muscle because i'm not broken anymore so it's uh yeah. it's definitely a, a series of processes i want more coaches and people to understand this stuff this is uh i don't believe the best athletes have been born yet because they haven't had these things genetically speaking sure but when we when the future generations are really able to tap into these things and we even understand it even better ourselves like but you look at sports like mixed martial arts in the ufc which are not fully developed they're not millions and millions and millions of dollars all over the place like the nfl is like it's gonna everyone's gonna be hitting nordics before they ever even get into the cage like everyone's gonna be able to do pancakes everyone's doing crazy heavy split squats hitting standards and it's going to be a very freaky time for uh, for athletic performance. There's going to become a new standard that everyone has to strive for. And uh, I'm looking forward to being a part of creating that change. Did anyone see that? Put you, Feel free to add any, anything, guys, questions as well, observations here. I think this is really yeah, – this is the discussions that coaches need to be having to, to get things to the next level. It's like how do I contribute to this and where – how do I embody this for myself? Uh, but yeah, you can use the the hand raise thing if, if uh, I'm getting wrapped up in something and you want to share. I'm always open to share, but I know sometimes you just want to listen in and, and hear the hear things as well. You can also use the chat box. Uh, did you see the? Uh, I think it's called uh, kabaddi, the Indian wrestling sport. Chris has got a question here as well. Yeah, Kevin saw. I posted on my on my IG. I don't know if you if you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, treat yourself. Look up the uh, Kabaddi next time you're you're on YouTube. Don't don't get stuck too long on the on the shorts and everything. The, the death trap. But the Kabaddi, there's a guy on there. He 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 shows up on the ones on Instagram and on YouTube. When I looked it up, he's jumping through the roof. It's ridiculous. Like he's he's got massive springs. And then sometimes he's going to land on his head and he just rolls super smooth and they attack each other. It's like this wrestling game that they play in India. And, and there's a pro version of it that apparently is on TV every night and they're so agile. And it's, it's amazing. I shared just one of the stories, one of the reels on my story. This guy was going to get tackled like a rugby tackle about around the waist. And the guy went under it with it, like so, so fast, but so deep into his squat. And then he got away. It was like a highlight reel. But yeah, like that's what you know. What where do we get to when we apply power training like weightlifters have, together with not being scared of pushing the tendons because we know how to fix them? Like I just avoided plyometrics with my athletes, and we you know we won the world championship. The, the opposing teams were asking like, "What are you guys doing?" Because you're so much more athletic than us. Like it was just ridiculous the things that they were doing, and they knew they were all hitting gym numbers that the other guys weren't hitting. But we didn't do plyometrics because I was too scared. We just did skipping and we did like some little drills in the warm-ups. And we jumped. We did counter movement jump. We probably jumped more than all the other teams. But now I would I would be able to hit them with more relax, elastic re, re, reactive stuff progressively. But I know how to prepare them for that, and I, then I know how to fix it. If I if someone says, "Oh yeah, my tendons are a bit sore," I know how to fix it. So that means you can push so much harder. If you've looked at the Jay Schroeder stuff, you know, what he did with Adam Archuleta. He treated Adam Archuleta was like, it's like a weightlifter, like a Chinese weightlifter, but applied to NFL. So like extreme dedication and and just like focused on just as much force as possible, as fast as possible. And then you go play your sport. But like treating it like 
like a real art in itself. Like the, it was like a martial art. Like Jay Schroeder's stuff is really, his mentality is really extreme. And the current best running back, um, I was just looking up his stuff the other day. I don't follow the NFL these days, but somehow it came across my path. He's a really good piano player, super skillful. Um, but his dad was like, his dad was a top player and he's been super disciplined all his life. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal sprint athlete. And it's like, it almost takes that multi-generational approach like Da Vinci with these multi-generations of uh, mentors. It's like Marinovich with his his son, Todd Marinovich, and then, and then the other one with this running back. Chris. Hey, Keegs, hope you're well. Um, yeah, I could be wrong here, but it seems like some of the like value of the sledding is that you're able to do that sort of light work and sort of hit everything in that lower body chain at the sort of, at the same time, and and do it for a long time. Um, and you may have just alluded to this before, but what would be like your upper body equivalent? Like, is it just high reps, um, like a chest press and a pulling movement, or like do you, do you have a move that you would consider to be the sort of upper body sled? Every everybody asks that. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's a good question. I've had yeah. I've had it many times. Uh, it's kind of handstands, brother. Like you, you, you don't really move much, and you get freaking jacked. Like handstands, hand hand balances are always shredded. Why? Because there's massive time under tension. They burn all the glycogen. They burn all in their arms because they spend so much time on their on their hands rather than their legs, which is going to take longer because there's a lot less tissue in the arms than there is in the legs. But yeah. I mean, you could do it with the ropes and stuff. Like you can do it with, um, I mean, the the rope, the, those rope ones, the the swings. Which uh, Louis Simmons was a fan of that. He he, they did it with chains. The, um, what's it called? That stuff. John Brookfield's a big fan of it as well. Battle battle ropes, like the the battle rope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think battle ropes is probably the best, and that's quite full body, and that's going to burn a lot of glycogen, and that doesn't. It's got a bit of an eccentric component to for the trunk, maybe, but it's not it's not heavy. Um also like seated sled pulls, then it becomes more like lats and biceps, where the the triceps are big, lats are big too. Triceps are two thirds of muscle girth in the in the arm. So kind of want it to be tricep. Like you can play around with that stuff, but yeah, if if you if you superset those things and you're just like burning burning glycogen upper body, burning glycogen lower body, keeping the heart rate up, like it's a fair shred journey. I mean, co- row, rowing machine is a great co- like concentric only strength exercise, burns a ton of glucose. So whenever you're getting lactic acid produced in massive quantities, then you're gonna it's gonna be burning glycogen. Like with sleds, they'll make you want to vomit, right? So yeah. if, with row, rowing machine as well, also going to make you want to vomit. Um, so these, sure. are, these and are- I just saw someone mention this, um, and I've actually been doing it myself recently. But um, would swimming be a, a good equivalent? Yeah, it kind of is. Like I've, swimming is really bad for fat loss, and maybe it is because of that lack of oh, eccentric. It generally isn't very effective for fat loss, but yeah, you, I mean, you can get that. You can get the glycogen burnt for sure, swimming, you know, deep water sprinting and stuff. Um, I think just having no strength training, you know, no eccentric component to it, no muscle damage, like that something about that environment, like the no gravity, um, it's it's it is a bit different in some way. Like ski erg is an, is an, is another one, right? Like concentric only. Um Sprinters like sprint swimmers are generally lean now because they but they they train hard in the gym like sprint cyclists like they they're hitting they're hitting twenty RMs on the leg press and the squats and then you know they got the the biggest legs you'll see are on cyclists right where they hit concentric dominant stuff and then they hit high volume in the gym as well and heavy stuff in the gym so it's that that combination of massive pump massive concentric volume together with the heavy lifting high lip high rep heavy lifting some of the legs that you see on this cyclist are just off the charts seen devices for the pool i think the pool is really good at like a very gentle starting point if someone's like really really messed up but like they make like this bar the problem is it was mainly the convenience factor because then you have to procure the equipment and have the pool but like 
it's like a barbell and it has like kind of like as you push and pull it under the water then it has like it creates resistance so it is concentric only and your you know the speed of which you do it is ultimately going to be uh you know the stimulus that you get out of it but um i've also seen like similar to like just the sled only drag like they have one of those that at the gym that just goes straight down so if someone does have like an elbow tendinopathy you could do that or maybe the reverse direction uh for the bicep it's just there aren't really that many great from what i found this like the sled works so effortlessly or a backwards treadmill or pushing something but for the upper body it's it is it is it is dependent um yeah yeah, there the, are there some of those rope ones are cool. Uh, have you done prone backstroke, or is that is that you pulling our leg here, Lachlan? <laughs> <laughs> on your on your front swimming backwards, you gotta, you gotta cause yeah. it, cause yeah, it, no, I just, just thought about like if you think about it, like to mimic to mimic what a like backwards walking in the sled is like that's your prone backwards swim. Like do the same action, but the amount of how tough that would be is just insane. It's like continuous trap three race. <laughs> How do you breathe? So, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's good to, it is good to run these mental gymnastics around ways of playing with things, but ultimately it's like, what problem are you trying to solve? The, the, the sled thing is, is solving the, it's giving you this massive reserve of ability to deal with tension in the knees. It's giving you this um, preparation for the long range stuff. And yeah, it depends on what the purpose is. Like that's that's the cool thing about uh, the sled work, but you can do. There's machines like the if you have you know who I'm talking about with Marinovich. There's a list of coaches who I feel like you should know who they are in the uh, athletic vault uh, in the in the life system in the athletics. There's an area that's like all the coaches that I think you need to know something about, and I've selected some of their videos there. One of them is is Marinovich and the Marinovich system. So he actually uses devices in the, in the water as well. And it creates like an isokinetic stimulus. So it's it's like same same speed isokinetic. It's it slows it down. So you're getting some like normalizing and equalizing of speed. He he designed his own machines because he was uh played for the LA. He played for the Raiders wherever they were at that time, Oakland or LA or somewhere, and. Um, and he heard he, he was really strong. He played a bunch, but he, his back was wasn't good. And so when he quit or when he finished, he designed this system for NFL players to be more athletic, to be more elastic, to be more powerful. It's a beautiful system, and it's been used a lot with fighters. One of the fight coaches that's used it the most was on Rogan a number of years ago. Um, and there's there's a couple of main students that do it now. There's a new guy that's actually just come on IG the last year or so. I've shared his stuff a couple of times. People from ATG sometimes like put it up as like, hey, look how shit this guy's stuff is. But I, I love it. It like he posts the most foot speed stuff. It's uh Brian Brian McGinty, I think is is the name. Um he's got like 150,000. He might you might be more now. I'll I'll uh I got my phone here. My trusty second brain. Yeah, but The the Marinovich stuff is cool, and he built his own um, he built his own machines that were able to produce these iso isokinetic uh, outputs. So that's also what you're going to get with the uh, what's it called the uh, like the ex the eccentric device and the. Uh, the flywheel training, right? The flywheel training also gives you like this constant tension thing. And they talk about the emphasis on the eccentric, but depends on which machine you're on and how you use it. They can be really concentric dominant as well. And some of these machines that Marinovich devised are kind of like the flywheel as well. I think flywheel training is going to go massively more mainstream. Most of the pro teams are using it. Um, it's just a little bit price prohibitive in terms of the investment. But if I was training people out of my garage and I wanted people to, to come from around the place to come and see me, I'd have a flywheel for sure, because it's a, again, it's a competitive advantage point of difference, really powerful for repairing muscles. I have three of them. <laughs> They're all in storage. Um, I had three on Sark. I have one of them's worth like $25,000. Um, it's from, uh, from a new, the New Zealand company that uh, produces them. 
Again, names slipping off the tip of my tongue, but I bought like there's a super cheap one out of the Spain. That's that's really fun as well. It was like six hundred dollars or something, but I broke I broke it pretty fast because you're not meant to like hammer it because it's a little like portable training device. But if you haven't trained with flywheel, it's it's kind of like sled where you have this feeling of like this is amazing. Um, has anyone has anyone trained with it? I don't know how how prevalent they are. What does the stimulus feel like? What is uh, as opposed to like? Because I've seen the ones where it just kind of looks like a uh, a belt squat type of setup. This is the uh, Brian McKinty. Yeah, you can use it for belt squats. He's only got the. It's not a very good one. Yeah, he does a lot of this stuff. This is one element of the Marinovich system. Is just like speed of speed of contraction and like there's a lot of foot and foot plyometric type stuff, but it's, it's multifaceted. He's the Marinovich system was very complete. Brian tends to just post the speed stuff. I don't know whether he uses the other stuff, but yeah, the stimulus feels Sam, like you can push as hard as you can for the whole range. So it's a different feeling to the squat where the squat has that little sticking point or bench press. It's like, okay, this part, I know I'm going to be easy here and I'm wondering if I'm going to get through this spot and then I know it's going to be easy again. But the flywheel, it's not like that. It's like your neural system is going 100% the whole time because you're going like, ah! and even if it's, even if you're not producing a lot of force, it's making you go slow enough that you're producing as much as you can in that position. Oh, it kind of like revs up a little bit as you start to like push harder on it, right? Some some of them it's a, it, it doesn't really accelerate very much. Um, it's you get it gets to an easier position, um, but then you can also like choose to stop it. So then it wants to pull you back down. And the the one that I have the twenty five thousand dollar one has like a motor in it where it can pull you back down even harder than you put into it. So like it's pulling you back down even more than you pushed up. And, and so you, you're fighting against it, but you cannot win. It's it's going to drag you through the floor. So, but you don't get muscle sore. That's that's the interesting thing about it is like you get like extremely low muscle soreness. So you, you neurologically it's taxing because it's a bit of a funny noise coming through there, like a vacuum cleaner. Um, neurologically it's taxing because you're putting maximum force into this device, and and it's like constant output. But uh, yeah, it's 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 a different kind of taxing, I guess, to instantaneous output of of speed work, and then it's very it feels very safe, Sam, because there's no there's no jerking about it. Like it's it's just very smooth force, and it's the force that you want to put into it, and you can get a good pump. Um, a lot a lot of elite sports teams are using it. I've been talking to this this New Zealand company. They're they're the world leaders in the technology. They want to get more mainstream adoption, but they just only focus on research and pro teams. They're not, they haven't focused on, I'm to keep telling them like give Graham Tuttle one, get like someone like that to tell the world about it. They just don't, they don't really care about the consumer market that much because they feel like it's too expensive to put in your garage. But one, people will put them in their garage and two, every CrossFit box should have one. Like I would, I would go at that market. Like they've got the money for it. They're not that expensive. There's models that are only like one or two grand. Like it's a, it's a squat, squat rack. Um, so yeah, that's definitely worth getting a, getting a feel on one. There's yeah, there's one in like they're around the place. There'd, there'd be people around you that have them somewhere. Put on your IG. Like, hey, I want to test one out. Like repost one of the things and say like, I want to test one out. Maybe one of the tag all through all the companies see if one wants to send one out. But um, yeah, maybe at this point like, I can get one. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. I'll probably get one at some point anyway. It's all it's all good. I am curious. Yeah, I mean you, you you might not like it. Like don't just get it off my but I I think it's an amazing tool and I do think it's gonna go way more mainstream. Like um I've encouraged Ben and I've like told these guys to send one to Ben, like, but he doesn't really want to do that stuff because he still wants to train his 16 year old self you know any 16 year old self is not going to do that but that doesn't mean it's not the best thing in the world for half of his other clients who aren't 16 yeah, anymore i mean his approach is definitely like 
as simple and easy to get into as possible. Like if you don't have this, you can literally do it from anywhere with anything type of idea. Like, I mean, of course it would make sense for all the calf rays and leg curl machines in the world to be in, you know, the ACG HQ, but not everyone's going to have access to all the fancy equipment. So just make it as simple and basic as possible. I mean, he wasn't even taking like supplements at a certain point. So, um, yeah, which is, which is good. Like, and the system's excellent, but is it, the best possible like i don't think he's trying to be the he's not trying to break all the world records he's not trying to you know so it's that's not the goal of the system so it depends on what your your goals are as well and what what you can afford and what you know who you want to train but if your goal is to have like a standout personal gym or like something that people will travel in to have an experience with then your goal is different to creating the ultimate budget online experience like you have to consider the goals of the person telling you what they're telling you I, I tell my clients the same thing. Like they'll say like, Oh, like you can, like I've seen it and Ben was only able to do this with exercise alone. And I'm like, that's amazing. But like, why would you not use every advantage possible if you're serious about getting better? Like you're not him. Like in all fairness, there are peptides. If you're seriously injured, that's, that's also a game you can play. Like why would you not get the massage and do the sauna and the cold plunge and, you know, get the, the fancier equipment and, and whatever else it is. Like take all the advantages you have. Like this is, you know, in all fairness, I'm sure Ben could have done his results in a fraction of the time uh, if he if he were to implement everything. And I don't mean like significantly so, like it might be five instead of eight years or with the current knowledge he has now and everything. But it's just, uh, you know, you don't have to follow the exact path. Why not improve upon it? Like where it makes logical sense at the end of the day. So yeah. it's amazing, honest marketing from him. I know 100 yeah. percent like he's, he's doing what he says he does. And that's that's really great honest marketing for his product, but that's not what everyone else should do because they're not marketing his product. <laughs> like, it's, like it's it's good for for that. But um, yeah, one of the the men who was in real movement in the early days, 20, 2015, 2016, has one of the flywheels in his house. He's really smart with his training, actually. He plays strong, good vertical jump training. He's in Sydney, Australia. I haven't I haven't checked out his stuff for a while, but uh, it was probably a year ago I looked at it and was like, yeah, he's he's worked out a bunch of the same stuff that that I believe in. It's like a really nice mixed mixed approach. Like he understands the ATG stuff, but then he's gone into some of these other force things, which if you're a vertical jump specialist, I think there's, there's definitely other places to look if you're going to pride yourself on that. I, think I had looked into the... Not. Oh, I'm sorry, please, someone else. <laughs> I've been talking. I, I had looked into the flywheel training... Um for kind of training housewives on Long Island for their home gym. It's like a sexy piece of equipment. Um, it's something different when they're trying to have like more of like a showroom kind of gym instead of uh, something that's going to be getting to a top end range kind of work uh, capacity and stuff. A um, little expensive. There's a company, K-Y-N-E-T-T. And uh, here in the States, they're going for about 450 and it'll uh, be on some sort of bar that can slide up and down, uh, you know, to adjust the height of the resistance training. So another, another toy I was considering when uh, during COVID, but uh, didn't pull the trigger on. It attaches to the bar, that one? Um, if you, if you look at, Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think I had I had one of I have one of these in storage. They're from uh Holland, right? Uh this is one that that just pulled up. It was a different company when I was originally looking that they had one that was more grounded. Um that you know it depended on the tension that you wanted to do, if you wanted to do some uh, squat movements. Uh, or or deadlifting or or use it rowing, um, and then there was another that that sort of looked like um, a beltless squat setup, uh, where it was in the center of a platform that you would kind of like hook in uh, hook in there. But I I haven't dug deep yeah. into the companies in a while. Yeah, I I like the those ones and use it like the belt squat type use is, is uh, feels amazing i love it 
Yeah, eccentric, E X X E N T R I C. Yeah. yeah, I think they're the main two. Um, yeah. 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 Pulling up the name of the one that. Uh, yeah, this is the. This is the. Eccentric. But I could see what you were talking about that if you're really going at it, you're going to destroy this thing or it's not going to be able to provide the level of uh, resistance that you might be looking for. That, those, those ones might. It's um, it's it's the, the, the one I had was like a really, like really small. Like it's meant to like fit in your, you could travel with it. Like it's thing it weighs under a kilo. It's it's like a little device that you screw into stuff, and it's it's really cool, but yeah, not uh, yeah. I'm trying to reimagine the living room for older people. That instead of a place of sitting on your ass and eating crackers, that uh, you're swapping it out for like functional gym equipment. Like this is what you should be actually living with, and um, you know it's also a really gentle type of resistance that they can uh that they can use um but um yeah we'll see how that goes chris's uh home gym design <laughs> we put we put wrestling mats down on the gym on the, on the gym floor on the uh i'm just gonna mute you there for a sec chris is having fun and games it's, uh, but um, yeah, we put wrestling mats down in the living room slash kitchen floor here. Kids love it. Maya started doing cartwheels spontaneously this afternoon, but we've been having wrestling matches and stuff in the in the lounge room. It's like set the environment for it. There's a really high beam as well. It'd be perfect for having like rings and ropes inside the house. But there should be more houses like it. So one one family put a they put a rope that you had to use the rope to get up to the attic and they were sleeping in the attic in their house. It's one of the ones that I knew through the gymnastic stuff, rope climbs every day. Kevin. Yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering, like given the West side plan you're following and then the increment, uh, in, including the flywheel, because you know, when you have, you can get a fly without a motor, motor and with a motor. And then you have stats that you're, you can read visually off if you've connected Bluetooth to your phone and then you can put on different plates as well. Uh, and then I know there's a guy on the workshop. I think he was using this with the rugby teams, which is like the meta force output. Maybe it's like force plates. But if you were doing like your speed day or what kind of, where, where would you fit the flywheel in when it comes to like programming or days within the West side system and like what sort of force plate velocity or velocity would you be looking to achieve yeah it's a good question i think you use the use the faster ones on the sp more speed days and the heavier one on the on the i, I think it'd be really good to use as a prep before you do your super heavy stuff uh, it seems the west side guys went in like the program looks like that the first thing they do is the maxed effort um but maybe they were prepping themselves for it and just turn up and doing their own thing to make sure they're going to be good to go. You know, they say you don't know West side unless you're there. Like the, the thing that I'm doing, I'm not following West side. It's just the template of having two, two speed days and two max effort strength days. And then taking the pressure off those other three days, I still train, but I like it's repetition method. Um, but I don't try and do anything too special on those other days. That's, that's what I'm taking. It's not really, very west side at all i'm sure west side would anyone who's a power lifter would think it's ridiculous or sacrilegious to call it west side but yeah i think i think it'd fit in on either day to use the flywheel stuff i don't think it necessarily should be used exclusively but like for example with soccer players and nba players and such it seems as though you would get significant strength stimulus and, and keep keep muscle on without the soreness by using little bits of that but you like i haven't used it in that context but it makes sense that a lot of the top organizations are getting those devices because if you're not going to get the same amount of muscle damage but you can get a strength stimulus then there's there's uses for it 
then where it fits in for you or where it fits in for someone else like depends on the context like i i'm guessing it's not going to be the best way to add muscle but there there are studies that show that it's that it is really good for adding muscle so it's it's still kind of early with it Yeah, and a follow-up question I had at first was when we were talking about the range and including the risks that you're talking about with gen pop, I'm not talking about gen pop, I'm talking about like people that have definitely trained for a good while like ourselves, uh, including like the pulses and like the active um, a- activation, you know, pulse if you're in a long range, you know, split squat and you're dropping your knee to the floor and then you're coming back up as if you're going into splits. And then... The way that you know, if you had Usain Bolt or you have Dmitry Klo- Klokov, they're like they're really, really strong, but also really, really flexible. As in, like, what I don't know if you're aware of what Klokov's routine looked like, or is it just years and years and years of lifting? And then, what would be like the sequencing for someone not to get these, you know, issues with the tendons? And also, I know just flush it with blood, flush with blood first, uh, and then use certain progressions, but. With the pulsing, would you just recommend like that's a one time a week sort of thing or it completely depends on your tolerability as an athlete and your background? I, I get the context, but just, um, yeah, I don't know if that makes kind of sense here. If the goal is to get more flexible, how often should we be pushing the long range? Is this kind of... Yeah, like say if I want to get extreme long range uh, leg extension or, or human knee extension. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's only trends towards things. So if you're training someone in that and you want to keep them as a client and you don't want to hurt them and you, you're training them online and you don't really know, you know, what's going on with them that much, then like once a week would be intelligent. With that specific movement of the natural knee extension, big fan of doing like kneeling squats as the foundation. Like get do a bunch of kneeling squats, even weighted kneeling squats and single leg kneeling squats. So you make sure the knee is is going to handle being fully closed before you start going into the uh, natural knee extension. Now, if some people are going to be fine, they're going to be strong. It's going to be fine. But I know strong, healthy dudes who, who popped meniscus just getting into those movements. So. Uh, yeah, generally I would, I would say pushing the long range hard once a week is, is fine. Touching on it a little bit, you know, two or three times a week is, is good. If you want to touch on every day, then you should be mostly light or you should have done a decent amount of long range strength work to earn the right to do that. If splits is easy for you, then you can do splits every day. If you've been doing it every day for 10 years, then you can do it every day. But if you're looking to get into splits and you're not that strong in those positions yet and you're, you're having to hold your weight up, you're not laying on the floor with your you know, crotch on the floor, then uh, you don't want to you don't want to do that too often. You know, you, you want to give your, your tissues some chance to adapt because you are pushing for adaptation of the fascia and the tendons. And I, I don't like doing any of the sliding eccentric stuff on the adductors. I think you should have an extreme base of strength for years before you do that. I know two guys who've torn like pop tendons do, doing that stuff. It's just, you know, why? Why? What's it's not worth it. When you go at it the way I teach it, with doing the wide stance squats first and then, you know, horse stance and wide stance squats, go heavier with wide stance squats, you know, squat heavy weight on the back. The West Side guys did that. Um, and then take weight off is what you want to do. You don't want to make it harder with slippery floor. Like that's effectively making it heavier. You want to take weight off. So you've got the bar above you, or you've got a band above you, you've got the band lifting you up, or you've got your hands on the ground. You know, I like doing those push-ups with the hands on the floor at the front, hands on the floor at the back. Um, and yeah, like three sets and, and then yeah, done for the week. Like I, that's, that's all I need to do to be able to progress it. Like once a week, three sets, do it after squatting and it progresses. Now I might not be as bound up as some and cause I've already done it before. Like I'll get there faster than most, but yeah. Is that, is that, is that useful? Is that kind of what you're asking or is this? Yeah, no, it gives me a better idea about like including it. Cause I was toying with the ideas, like how close could I have, um, say RDLs, Jefferson curls, and say if I did a deadlift and then separating the days between them and then 
you know, um, am I going to, you know, snap my shit up? I haven't yet. And, but it's been very much like sequencing in a way where there's a day or two between each movement and I wouldn't do those very close to each other. Like, um, but yeah, I'm not as conscious of, of the injury sort of thing. Your body, your body will tell you as well. I'm not very conscious of it. I'm like, fuck you, buddy. Just, you know, this is what I'm telling you to do. <laughs> fucking do it. <laughs> so that's why, like, for me, it's better like, hey, once a week, don't be silly. And then I end up doing it two or three times if I really want to do it. And it's like, at least I didn't do it every day. Um, that's that's more what I'm like. My tendency is just see if you can go through the brick wall, see what happens. But your body will tell you, like, hey, like, that's heaps of tension. Like you need to be fearful in this position. Like your body starts to, you, you sense it. Just don't, don't break yourself. Like it's, you know, but if you're programming it for someone else, then you don't know that they know. And in such to some degree, they just want to trust you. And you know, that's where it becomes like, like if they're not trusting themselves. Makes sense. Cheers. Luke. Howdy. I've got to take this opportunity to ask you tendon wizards. So it was like 18 months ago. I did this two-day kettlebell certification. We we're doing like snatches for time. It was about 12 hours of work over the two days. Lateral epicondylitis. So that's what? Elbow tendon. So I'm thinking back to what you're talking about. Short range, flood it with blood. You gave the example of the gentleman with the 5Ks and then the 7.5 kgs. So what... Am I not doing that? Is it making this be completely gone after so long? Yeah. So the, the tennis tennis elbow is the colloquial name for it. You put more t- tension into that tissue than it was ready to accept. And then as uh, Dr. Ben, if he's still on here, I'm not sure if he's still here. He was here before. We were talking about it yesterday. No, he's not still here now. But he, he had a back issue and then he went to a pain specialist and they're like, yeah, your body just knows now to worry about that area. You have to teach your body not to worry about that area. It's actually not the tissues. It's just that your brain's worried about that area now. So you got to do yeah. stuff that doesn't cause any issue and do lots of it and stop causing an issue there. And you teach your brain, hey, this area is fine. So how do you do that? Yeah, like I, I really like if you've got those 10 kilo bars or, you know, the you can start with a broomstick if you want, but you probably 10 kilo bar is probably fine. Um, I love holding it at the waist and then you hold you're holding it at the waist and and I like curl it down into the fingers and then extend up. You get like this this way's flexor, you know, so you're getting the flexor <laughs> stimulus and then you're getting extensor stimulus. You let it out. I, I love doing them. I saw it off uh, arm wrestlers. I love checking out arm wrestling training foundation stuff because it's really hard on tendons arm wrestling you do do that with the 10 kilo bar just holding it both hands bilateral uh, like sets of 50 just get a get a massive pump and um, if it's too heavy then it'll stir it up and then you'll be like okay well that was that was too heavy um, if you go slower with it and you see that's more gentle <clears throat> Before you, you know, even before you do that, you can heat the area. So you could, you can, you know, you can either wear a brace or you can put hot water on it. You can put a hot pad on it. Like anything, it's like breaking metal. If you want to break metal, if the metal is colder, then it's going to be easier to snap. If the metal is warmer, then it's going to be bendy, like chewing gum. So you, these tissues also have those same properties. So the more heat that you have in the area before you do this, then the easier it's going to tolerate it as well. But this is this is short range because. The, that's the hardest part and then by here it's there's no load and then the long range would be here long range is here where it's mm. pushing up. so then eventually you want to be able to do long range so how do you do long range you do on the, on the floor handstand on the back of the wrist you do you know loading into fist into uh, like on the on a on the floor so when you when you're doing like reverse push-ups and stuff on the floor like hand balances we do this sort of work Hand balancing is really tough on the forearms and wrists and they'll fix it with this stuff. Check out the um, Devin Larratt is the, the arm wrestler. Maybe someone wants to drop a link of some of Devin Larratt stuff. His, his stuff is awesome. He does a bunch of band training with, uh, with, for the wrist, like just take pride in 
getting a bigger forearm without annoying anything. So all the movements that don't bother it, just hit them for sets of 50, sets of 100. Don't, don't do anything that bothers it. And then when you can start to stretch it, stretch it. But the goal initially is just pump, get work done. Don't mm-hmm. do anything. Don't do anything crazy. How many days a week would you be putting work through the forearm and elbow? Like it depends. It depends how an irritated and fragile and stuff it is. But generally, those ones are not like hypersensitive, and they're not um, they're not crazy. It de- it de- yeah, has it been like swelling, and is it is it really sensitive to touch? Like, is no, it? It was like that for the first maybe yeah. three months. Now it's just like a niggling, consistent. I yeah. really think you're onto something by saying I'm just guarding it. My brain's learned to be careful. That's a weak spot, so teach yeah. it otherwise. But it won't work just to be like fuck you, I'm just going to get on with things that that it's unlikely that that will work. Like you have to do it through this systematic, it's like getting used to spiders, you know, read a book about spiders and then have a spider on the other side of the room and then have a spider under the glass. Like you have to slowly introduce the stimulus to the, to the area. Um, and there is a physical component to it, but there is also that psychological component. Yeah. Kevin shared uh, the Devin Lara thing. If Thank you, you click Kevin. It. For the Which link, I've got a draw. I bought the Thera bar. It's like a twisty bar, which I yeah. imagine you can get the full short, full long other way. But yeah, yeah, all, all any like there's there's lots of different wrist devices that can all work. Like a, that stuff is is good. The goal is just if you go out with that mentality of like I'm not allowed to rip the scab off. Like that's that's a way that I think about. It. Like don't rip the scab off, but but bring some movement into that area. So if you imagine you had a, a scab on your skin, like you're allowed to move it around, but you're not allowed to rip it off. So nothing, nothing okay. crazy, nothing fast, nothing heavy, but you're, you 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 have to give some stimulus to the area, um, and that's like massaging scars is sort of it's sort of what you're doing on the inside in a way. Um, and awesome. Yeah, Thank you. Quickly on that note, so like massage guns, this sort of percussion stuff that just like puts vibrations through a body part. What's your hot take on that? I don't use them. I don't. I haven't needed them since I've done this stuff. There's something to it and they're kind of nice. If I had more time and someone else was going to hold it, like, you know, I'd probably, probably indulge, but I haven't, I ha- yeah, I haven't needed it since I've done things in this way. Um, I'm probably more of a fan, like fat tool, like fascial moving the lymph stuff makes, makes sense. And then, uh, yeah, like th- there is a place for massage and such, but, it's just generally it's not very accessible and then it's difficult to get the dose right as well because massage is kind of doing the same thing. It's kind of bringing heat and some degree of bleeding and some degree of stimulus to the area, but how, how do they get it just right for you without being like, they need to live in with you and they need to see you daily and get it right all the time. Like Charlie Francis was an elite sprint coach and he would massage his athletes all the time and he knew exactly how much tension they need. And he used the same therapists and, was an integral part of what they did if you had that then i'd be like yeah okay good but if you're going to just see some dude who's going to rip into it like it's not it's not likely to be the solution because you're also not getting that thing of like it's fine and i can get on with it so eventually yeah snatches and things are going to be like testing it um yeah kettlebell work but you'll, you'll get back to it eventually you want to face the demon of like you know, do light kettlebell work, do kettlebell swings, and and you know, you want to have the target of being able to do that stuff again. But totally. could be worth talking to Robbie as well. I don't know if he's come across it. it, it either you'll help him or he'll help you. Um, Robbie, Robbie, I think maybe I introduced you to him. He's uh, maybe not. He he joined. So he joined about two months ago. From he's British, but he's in Spain. He's uh, kettlebell expert and he's got great body composition loves his cooking stuff he's just got going online he's he's had a really good start to his online stuff it'd be a good conversation for you to have anyway uh, i would i'll reach out to to robbie what's his name robbie i'll okay. find him in the uncomment putting me on the spot sometimes i've don't have both their names so it's robbie harrison I think on his ig cool. he doesn't i'm not sure if he had it before maybe he does but yeah, it's robbie harrison awesome jeez welcome Let's yeah. Let us know how you get on with that. It's always fun to hear like year a year of stuff, a year and a half. I had them for ages as well, man. I had the hamstring insertion one from the pancake. When you do short range, it goes away. Like it's it's a beautiful thing. Would love to see this gone. I will keep you updated, Keegan. Thanks. Let's do it, Lucky. Uh, 
my am I not allowed to clear my AirPods are being up to like this? Is this all good? It sounds a bit muffled. Uh, um, one, yeah. Can you hear me there? Yeah, it's crystal. Yeah. Uh yeah, Luke, I was just gonna ask, with that uh with that elbow stuff that you're going through, was that are you continuing to do the kettlebell work? Or is it also, or is it just consistent and persistent through training? I haven't let it, I guess it's impacted my movement selection a little bit for stuff that really hurts it, which is usually like straight arm stuff and downwards force is when I feel it. I can still lift kettlebells. I can still, the most I swing and clean and press is a 16 kilo kettlebell at home. But I'm making stuff work like that. But it's just been this consistent forever there. I've basically learned to live with the type thing. But now I'm bringing it back to the forefront of my focus because it should be gone. Yeah, I think that. So I was 75% I was listening to what Keegan was talking about with the, with the short range. Sorry, I just finished training. Um, and I think that that's super important for the recovery component of it. But if you're still doing a lot of straight arm work with that requires a lot of shoulder stability demands, then you might want to look, look into your your movement screen through your like internal external rotation through the shoulder because if you've got certain like if you i think you said at the start that you haven't been exposed to the range stuff as much yet quite quite new to it yes yeah so if let's say that if you've got tight pecs tight pec minor then you might be being pulled internally rotated which can have a certain effect down the chain on the elbow. So if we look at the global stability demand, like our body is always going to put a kettlebell overhead. It's going to go through whatever structures it needs to, to support that. And so if we've got, if we've got uh, tissue like issues closer to our center of mass where we balance and we're trying to support something overhead. And if we're, if we're being pulled into internal rotation here, that's going to affect the way that we stack that kettlebell here up top. And so that might be, that might be one of the reasons why uh, I like, I, I coach throwers and when we have um, shoulder issues, it's a, it's, I, I don't want to say that it's purely external rotation work that we do, but we combine external rotations into the other patterns down the chain, incorporating the forearm, the elbow, the rotations and, and making sure that that's, uh, it works both ways. And so it's it's from the hand through up through the elbow, but it's also understanding that the shoulder, the way that the shoulder bears load is going to have a downstream impact on the way that the elbow takes the load as well. And so if that's because the elbow is like a, a hinge joint, even the rotation from the wrist comes from like the forearm. So the elbow only really does this so much, gets a little bit of hyperextension. But if it's trying to compensate because the shoulder which can do all of its magic up top. If that's not doing its magic up top properly, then it can have a loading or a, yeah, loading issue down as you go down lower. So uh, I, I would yeah check out um, things like your seated external rotation uh, and like pec range doing your Smith curls uh, are a really good place to start with seeing how that impacts your uh, ability to maintain just like a straight like shoulder support through that um yeah shoulder support while holding a kettlebell and probably like play light and i'd probably focus on just the movement of your shoulder blade doing a uh like just doing movement without like a max load and just seeing how it affects it when you go through certain rotations of the of the shoulder and the forearm and start to you might need to find a new position that feels better that you can get stronger at because we're going to fall into our most energy efficient position and if that's mm -hmm. a position that is not like aligned with the rest of the body because we've got like mobility issues, then it's going to, uh, yeah, like you're going to feel that somewhere. Like there's going to it's going to appear somewhere. Like I've dealt with a lot of this stuff with here, yeah, as a thrower. Like I used to do a standing fucking bench press. Sorry, standing bench press when I did overheads, arch my back, everything was tight. I had no shoulder mobility, and mm -hmm. yeah. Healing all of that has been a journey, but it's really made a difference. Like, so I hope that sort of insight helps a little bit as well. Yeah, thank you for the thoughtful response, bro. I've got a couple 
movements down here that I'm going to make sure I understand what it is and then try playing around with that internal and external. And I know there's a lot of resources back end, so I think I need to get deeper into Uncommon, the future expander and stuff, and make sure I'm not asking questions that are already answered. But thanks again. Yeah, no worries, bro. Hey, Luke. Re recently, I had uh, a big flare up in that el in my left elbow, and uh, it was thought to be the golfer elbow, or you know, on that inside part. And I've been uh, every day doing some of the the tissue remodeling, where you take a low incline bench and you take twenty five percent of your body weight, and you're getting your shoulders on the top of it and just letting the arms hang down for 30 seconds at a time. Um, and that has in the last two weeks, I just no longer really um, have thought about my uh, elbow pain and it's definitely uh, has not affected me. So uh, I think that might be really good in that really opening up uh, into the shoulder area here. Um, I know Keegan has a video where he's demonstrating the, uh, you know, 30 second holds for tissue tolerance. Keegan, do you have a name for that, uh, specific movement? That's a Smith curl. That's like a, I, well, I think it's a isometric Smith curl. If, if it's the one I'm thinking of, like incline bench, lean back, open the shoulder. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that would be the isometric and which sounds like tissue me remodeling. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard the Comerford curl, but yeah. yeah. I first oh, like all new really names since hanging out with you guys, all new names of movements. But yeah, thank you. It sounds like that would be to what Lachlan was saying, releasing like if you had to bet, I'm probably tight in this anterior side, all the computer and driving and typing and whatnot. So yeah, noted. Thanks, Chris. course yeah it's there's definitely often multiple ways to solve these things multiple potential solutions and the overall shoulder mechanics and looking at your positions valuable regardless you want you want to have those open positions and the atg cross bench pullovers and nice line on the handstand all these things are good foundations um so yeah Good to explore doing arm work directly before you do the, the forearm work can also be a good idea. I like, I like to work around it before I work on it. So um, yeah, that's, that's another tip that I didn't mention there, but yeah, you will find these materials within, within the range method course. There's quite a bit about this and you'll find that like a lot of the players want to discuss this stuff as well. If you put it out there that, Hey, like I'm, I'm working on this, um, it'd be good if you want to share something, Kevin, around your your journey there with that, because we haven't had an update for a while, and uh, maybe that's a good one to finish off. We're closing on two hours. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's well, crack, lads? Um, bit of background about basically why I'm such an advocate of exactly this conversation, what's going on with Keegan. Um, so about five, six, no, I say six, seven years ago, I had an injury, and the my background is basically when to go professional in sports. And it's like, that was my route. I was on the academy for Leinster Rugby. And um, I was playing on this injury and I was only training once a week. So what happened is I tore the top of my hip flexor uh, or rectus femoris, it's a grade two tear. And I got like MRI scans, all this sort of stuff, did all this fucking specialist sports science training shite. And um, then, you know, it was just, I was trying to go to every match, trying to go to every match, boom, boom, boom. And just once a week, that's it. I, I couldn't sprint. If I sprint, I try to get out of that bed, lift my knee up, and I, I'm cycling to school on one leg, cocking that pedal back, going upstairs, one leg, and then I wait a week until I hit that game again. And like they're asking you to train at least two, three times a week. And then alongside this, I went to sprinting for 400 meters. And I had three months of training, I came eighth in the All Ireland final with this injury. Okay. And give context, that's been three training sessions. And then Come years and years after, it's like, fuck, this is injuries annoying the shit. I mean, then Hong Kong comes, have a conversation with Keegan. All right, it's, it seems like it's not the easiest thing to actually fix. But then this range training stuff, 
explode it like there's no tomorrow like l- literally stay so consistent with the short range stuff do different directions if it's straight leg knee bends if it's uh, bent knee raises whatever it might be and I shit you not doing that plus uh, the long range stuff that Keegan said plus what Keegan is saying where it's like you have a scab and your brain goes oh fuck oh fuck it worries it worries oh my god this thing and then you gradually expose it and Keegan was saying oh just do 10D you know 1800 mirrors and I did it then I walked went down from 18 seconds to 12 to 14 seconds and then to be able to do that back to back man that's pain for uncom a billion times over you you can't you change my life man like no you can't undo that like to me you have no clue as a person like that's your life going pro and all, that's all you think about and then for this it's like you fucking reignite that fire and lads I cannot like thank Keegan enough and I swear to god anyone I am an absolute advocate of this and it's gonna work a treat and I'm not I'm telling you now it looks like a little fucking shark has bitten out at the top of my hip if you've ever seen it before uh, on one of these calls Um, but yeah just to let you know and then um, much appreciated, Keegan. And uh, yeah, it's going great. Exciting to hear. Thanks for the share, Kev. Because we had a few days together in Montenegro and and uh, Kev was still sort of like, oh, this is what's going on. And we, yeah, we, we I was racking my brain of how you would do it because I was sort of thinking more so of like lower rec fam and it's like upper rec fam. I haven't, you know, haven't really had too many of them. So it's really cool to hear, Kev. Like I know you were you were running the hills back there in the in Montenegro, but if you're running 14 second hundred repeats and you're moving, and uh, yeah, it's it's a good path to be on. And I know it means a lot to you, so it's it's good to hear you hear you expressing that as well. Yeah, take it where you want. Uh, did you want to share something there, Zach? You uh, you've been tuned in, listening in. Did you have any thoughts or questions? I can hit you the little pop up for yeah, no, you. I'm, I'm certainly uh, just absorbing information. Um, got some, uh, uh, I've certainly got a few niggles that I'm trying to work through. So I've got some ideas to, to work on them with. Good. Yeah, yeah we can feel free to I mean, bring uh, them up. Certainly, uh, elbow work has come a long way um in the last couple last couple of months um the last couple of weeks actually uh came across some or doing some short wearing stuff has sort of made a big difference um lower body um i dislocated my ankle and had a tibial plateau fracture years ago and sort of really don't have any don't have a great deal of ankle mobility left like I can't, I can't stretch the calf because um, the ankle just doesn't go there. Um, and you want to address that, or oh, I would, I would love to, I would love to, but uh, oh, um, <laughs> no, like I get it. Once it's something's been like that for a long time, you're like, well, maybe it's maybe it's never going to be any better, but maybe maybe it can be as well. Uh, have, did you listen to the Brian Michelson? Uh, presentation uh no i haven't haven't heard that one i'll check I'll check the brian michelson presentation from the uncon workshop number one um he's got 12 kneeling postures so he works kneeling and uh he's got different positions that you need to be able to get into so it's for the hip it's for the knees it's for the lumbar spine particularly like quadratus lumborum but it's also for the for the feet and for the ankles you won't be able to do all those positions right now perfectly, but the way I would go at it, if if I was just to fantasize about gaining a millimeter of range or or maybe two, uh, would be put it in hot water uh, with with magnesium as well. See, Kev, get laid over there. Thanks for sharing. Uh, put it in hot water, magnesium, get it really warm, like as hot as you can stand, and then do. Uh, like do you can already do so many training but do like split squats and you know do uh seated calf raises like there's different variations of how you can train that stuff calf stretch on on block but get it warm even you could go in and out of it between sets 
uh, do high rep calf work and then also use those uh, those positions that Brian is talking about. Just sit there for hours, you know, accumulate hours over the course of uh, weeks and months um, in those positions and just, yeah, see what happens. Maybe, maybe you get a little bit of gain. Maybe you start to feel the muscle stretch, you know, where the, the bone is not just fully blocked. Because even when it's bone, even bone changes, man. That's the funny thing. Like they they told us that there's a type of shoulder that just doesn't go overhead. This was Eric Cressy. He, he works for the New York Yan- uh, Yankees as their their guy. Like he's the number one shoulder expert in the world. And he wrote an article saying there's different types of acromion, pro- acromion you know, processes, acromion process, I think it is, um, that, that some people just aren't going to get their arms overhead. And and he had that in in his articles that he was writing in the early two thousands. But now we know that the shoulder actually remodels, and everyone can put their arms over the head, and the the process will get the fuck out of the way if you keep asking it to. So it's like maybe it takes you two years, maybe it takes you five to get back to where you were. Like, do you care? Like, would you do it? If you would, then you may as well play with it. Yeah, because I'm certainly certainly very aware of uh, the impact it has up the chain. My my mobility in the mobility in the hip is very different. Uh, from it can work on that as well. Like I don't, it shouldn't. Have, I know it would affect your hip if you're just thinking from a squatting perspective or pistols, but we can get your hip working identically. I wouldn't. I wouldn't accept that as uh, it's it's it is more difficult. Oh. But yeah, oh, like yeah. The, the ankle will probably take. I, I'm not telling you that's gonna. I, Luke, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets on in two weeks and he's like, yeah, sweet, I'm back at it. Like, it's it's possible with that. I, I don't think we're going to hear that from you, Zach, with this. Yeah. Like, I'm not telling you it's just going to be day in, one day to the next. But I, I'd, I'd love to see a needle wall and then see it three months from now, see it six months from now, and just see if if there's uh, if we get in some range, get some photos in some of those positions that Brian Michelson put up on his slideshow and you know, put, take a consult with Brian as well. Like I think he's putting together a, a system or a program around like sort of teaching how to use these positions and having some accountability around it. Um, but he, yeah, he's got, he's got really good stuff in general. Like his, his concepts are valuable. It's a bit like what Lockie was talking about with like patterns and up chain, down chain effects. It's, um, it's good stuff, but the floor posture is a pretty simple concept. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll look into that. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I'm aware that the hip is not directly yeah. like the lack of mobility in the hip can be fixed. It's not, uh, but it's just my the habits of my daily movement have caused that uh, difference yeah. because of the stemming from the ankle injury. Yeah, we've all we've all had that as well. Where it's like, okay, my knee's playing up, therefore my calf gets small. It's like, well, it doesn't have to, but it does. But yeah, that that's actually something that I found quite interesting is uh the leg that I broke is significantly skinnier than the other one, but still stronger. So it's my dominant leg and it's uh there's certainly a lot less hypo- hypertrophy on it, but um it is actually stronger than the, the bigger one. Yeah. Yeah, it's and the, I don't think, you know, most of us are never going to have 100% high, uh, symmetry and not yeah. everything's going to make sense, like, but it's okay to have some mystery and just work towards what we want. Um, thanks for, yeah, thanks for sharing with that. And let's yeah. you know, let's check in again on it when, when we're on next. Uh, Wesley is recently joined us in the Uncommon Man. I saw your intro there, brother. I just wanted to say, say hello and welcome. We've been on here for two hours. So the call's recorded, but... Uh, we're about to finish up, but congratulations on on joining the game and uh, yeah, welcome. If you want to share anything around this, see you, Josh. Thank you very much. I've uh, joined since uh, today, and uh, I've been following you for a longer uh, period of time. Uh, tomorrow at eleven thirty, I had a, have a plan to call with you, so I'm really looking uh, forward to it to uh, make some plans and. Uh, I will be in the future joining uh, or going to the Bali time chamber. And I just can't think of the things that are going to change. So uh, I'm constantly brainstorming and looking forward to uh, to more of it. <laughs> how, how old are you, Wes? Uh, I'm 20. Okay. 
Good on you, brother. To be that young, thinking these things and being around these people, you are going to be running things by the time you're like, I'm only 29, but dude, yeah, really cool to see such a young person in here getting among stuff like this. Good on you. Thank you, man. I've been not so excited about uh, many things in a, such a long time. So it's for me like uh, waking up and having the the energy to get out of bed and do things is like such an eye opener. So yes, thank you very much for the environment and uh, I want to change. <laughs> Good man. Yeah, welcome. And I think we all we all empathize with that. We've all had times where it's not Christmas day when you get out of bed in the morning. Uh, as a, those, those are like, if that's the 10 out of 10 is like Christmas day when you're a young child and you're just buzzing to get out of bed. There were a lot of days that weren't like that for me. And now it's it's maybe not quite there but it's somewhere close. Like most, most days it's like, this is going to be a great day. I get to wrestle with my children on the floor here and meet new people and speak other languages and have this conversation. And it's how it should be, whatever it is that you want, brother. Like you, if you're willing to, to create and move towards it, then it can be good. The, to, the today, easy way I, to today I did reach out to someone. I think, uh, is someone who I can, uh, get with uncommon success or build something with and he was like so positive because i uh proposed something to him to work together and work on ids and it was like it's not that hard so it's yeah i don't know what i can do everything but it's gonna be better than what i did yeah the thing is most people aren't really trying because they got so much so much baggage and so much negativity around them that they're not really trying. So once you actually try and you just feel good about putting your best effort in, you, you're already ahead of so many and and then you get work experience and you get practice and it's all skill development. If you can learn to juggle, you can learn to do anything else that you want to do as well. And your, your brain is very neuroplastic. We get this proven within Uncommon Success. Yeah, you got the, you got the balls out really good. Yeah. So yeah, some of the some of the players come in and within a few months they're five ball juggling. But it's it's the ones that are like closer to twenty that that tend to do that. Yeah, Sebastian I'm almost, almost to four, almost four. Good, good. <laughs> yeah, S Sebastian Albrechtson's just arrived in Mexico now. He he, he was in Mexico uh, in Montenegro village for four months or so, and he's just turning up to to Mexico now. He he learned to five ball juggle really fast. Odner as well is Odner's a soccer player from Norway, also I believe. But the young brain is so neuroplastic, man. It's 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 almost impossible to do that at forty or fifty to to get to five ball in that time. So it's really mm -hmm. exciting to think of like how fast your brain can change with other things as well, like understanding business and sales and you know products and offers. And you guys are going to be so much better than than me. You know, so much better than. Than, than all of us if if you focus and just do the work and I'm going to give you the best of what I have but so many of these other men are going to give you the best of what they have as well and you can see what what's working for others and then yeah you you set a new standard but it's going to take a couple of years but it won't take you so long like it's you know it takes when you work it out by yourself or you know it, it's you can teach an old dog new tricks but it's not as fast <laughs> So that's the, that's the exciting thing, man. Knuckle Bobby. down. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It should start much earlier. It should start at like 12, man. Imagine like it should start, it should start much earlier. Your kids, your kids, uh, if they want. Yeah, well, they only they only get to be around you guys. So, you know, that's the thing when, uh, when they, oh, there's always those conversations and connections. And so maybe we'll see. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. Life should be fun. We should look forward to a, a beautiful future. There's for sure. There's some dark influences here and there, but there's so much possibility. There's so many beautiful things that we can create, and yeah, we we have that opportunity, so we we should use it. And uh, yeah, you you decided to move towards that today, and we can discuss it more yeah. tomorrow. Yes. Welcome. And, Thank you. Uh, I look forward to the journey ahead. Yeah, I can see the other guys also excited for you as well. So. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoyed the conversation. If you listen back to the recording, also feel free to uh, leave comments, thoughts, ask questions, book a consult, whatever you need to do. But let's let's address the weaknesses. Let's get world best results. Enjoy the process. Yeah, Brandon, it would have been great too. We we need a one on one conversation with with you about this. I know you're 
you've got very deep thoughts. We'll, we'll get you on the workshop and go very deep on tissue quality and healing and, and getting people back to the best. But uh, great to have you on for the call as well, Brandon, even if you couldn't uh, contribute as much today. Thank you, everyone. And I look forward to the next one. Thank, Thank you, Jens. Have a powerful day. See you next yes, time. Have a nice evening.